Good afternoon, everyone. We're starting the panel uh, <coughs> called Regulating Blockchain and Distributed Ledger Identity. Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Juan Lanos. Uh, I'm an uh, advisor at One World Identity and uh, FinTech and RegTech lead for Consensus Enterprise uh, in New York. Um, this is a, I mean, I, I saw the One World Identity team build this entire platform, um, event and platform over the last eight months and it's been uh, fascinating to see them work and uh, I think they, they've done a great job and it's an honor to be here today, especially sharing the stage with these ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I've actually known them all before, so except for Jamie I had met uh, personally. And uh, this is a, it's gonna be an interesting discussion, we have a lot to say. We would like to make this, I like personally, I like to make this rather controversial or thought provoking. And uh, I think that uh, every conversation around regulation for blockchain or Bitcoin uh, ends in the diagnosis, but doesn't go into the proposed solutions or how, what, the way forward. So let's try to go there today, if possible. So uh, my background is in financial services and non-bank financial institutions, remittances, I've been working with financially excluded in New York City for 15 years. And uh, my side specialty, if you will, is anti-money laundering compliance. And uh, when I saw Bitcoin coming up, I raised my hand and I started advising the new crypto uh, investors and entrepreneurs about the risks of uh, using a value transfer mechanism that could be considered money transmission and I did that a few months, a few weeks actually, before the FinCEN guidance of 13. And, um, and I actually have been claiming that Bitcoin was born regulated, the blockchain was born regulated. And we can argue uh, for or against that, but that's my point of view. And the reason why I say that hyperbolically is that value transfer mechanisms have been regulated for a long time. So if you look at the regulations today, monetary equivalence or value that substitutes for currency and all those phrases are embedded in the statutes and regulations so as to cover new forms of value transfer. So when cryptocurrencies came along, the activities that could be performed with cryptocurrencies were already regulated. So here we, we, we're here to talk about the intersection between regulation and identity, blockchain and identity and regulation as it applies to both. So um, uh, the buyers of these, uh, our panelists are in the app, but I'd like to, uh, for them to introduce themselves briefly and tell us what they're working on today, their focus today, please. Okay. Hello everyone, good afternoon. My name is Andrea Tiniano. I'm director of Global Delaware and I'm also director of the Delaware Blockchain Initiative. Uh, this initiative uh, commits to using the technology, distributed ledger technology and state government and currently we're working on several use cases uh, involving our public archives, uh, our division of corporations, and we're also working on a very exciting use case uh, involving health records, which I'm happy to discuss a bit today. And thank you for having me. Hi everyone, uh, my name's Steve Ehrlich. I am the lead analyst for emerging technologies at Spitzberg Partners. We're a boutique corporate advisory firm based in New York, and we really try to put ourselves um, um, square in the middle of the political and regulatory issues facing new technology. So within the context of, of this panel, uh, I'm, a, I'm a certified information privacy professional for the United States, Canada, and European Union, and spend a lot of my time um, looking at how blockchain-based identity solutions align with data protection laws in, in those jurisdictions and some other key areas, and actually working through what are known as uh, data protection impact assessments to kind of have a systematic way of identifying uh, risks and, um, and and ways to mitigate those for 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 solution providers in the space. Hi, I'm Jamie Smith. I am a former uh, recovering government worker. I was uh, deputy White House press secretary and head of communications for the uh, U.S. intelligence community and then went into the blockchain space where I work for a company called Bitfury, which is the world's largest and leading full service blockchain technology to company. And by that, I mean we do mining, we do hardware, we do software, and we have recently launched um, the world's largest e-governance project in Ukraine. Uh, we also have our land titling project in the Republic of Georgia. And um, 
I wear a couple of different hats in the company, both on the communications and marketing side, but also we have started an initiative called the Blockchain Trust Accelerator with New America and the National Democratic Institute doing pilot projects for global good. And um, we also launched a sister organization called the Global Blockchain Business Council, which is designed to educate business leaders and regulators about how they can embrace this technology and not just understand it theoretically, but actually understand it through real pilot projects that are happening around the world. Uh, so I'm Alan Cohn. I'm an attorney and consultant here in, uh, in Washington. Um, for about nine years, ending in about two years ago, I was uh, at the Department of Homeland Security, so I'm a former government person like Jamie as well. Uh, I was the head of strategy there and um, oversaw a variety of different policy issues while I was there as well, uh, including for a time uh, cyber crime uh, policy, which is unfortunately my road into, uh, into the blockchain space. Um, but I work on issues involving cybersecurity and blockchain technology and other types of national security issues now. So this is the first conference I've been attending and speaking at conferences for 15 years, 14 years now. And this is the first time, especially in the AML world, AML CFT arena. And this is the first time I have heard an open discussion about digital information sharing of, of any kind among organizations or across industries or between government and industry. Because if you think about the parad paradigm today for financial crime prevention or information sharing or reporting, it's every, si every single company is mandated to comply with regulations on their own, to store identity of clients and customers on their databases, and to share to the government certain reportable activities, whether they're suspicious or um, you know, crossing certain thresholds, et cetera. So there's a one-to-one -one relationship between the regulated entity and the government or the supervisory agency. So but, but blockchain and the first blockchain, the, the real breakthrough was that it's a shared database, right? So we could be storing data and sharing it across multiple participants. And that is revolutionary in itself. And the moment I heard that, I started thinking, okay, there must be a way to implement some form of reporting, government reporting on the blockchain or any blockchain implementation. Of course, then we had to explain the difference between open and closed blockchains, proof of work based blockchains and non proof of work based blockchains. It's a lot of technical things here. But so, do you think that the, why is it that we're talking about blockchain and identity today? What, what is it that you think is the driver for this conversation? <coughs> any, any of you? Steve? First. <laughs> sure. I mean, when, when I answer this question, and I always like to kind of take us back to, to 2004, whenever we got our first Facebook account or, or Google account. I mean, we, we put up pictures and it was fun and our friends were on it and we could relive parties from the night before. But I don't think anybody really anticipated how big Google, those companies were going to become or really the way that like, big data um, algorithmics would develop, machine learning, and essentially how powerful those companies would be because they have this unparalleled trove of, of data to the point that they tend to know us better than we know ourselves. And I like to think that if we could go back in time and sort of recreate our, our personal data ecosystem, it would be done in a way that we have control over that information and, we, and it's cryptographically secure so that we can share it under terms and conditions that we set. And if you think about a way to do that, uh, I, I believe that a blockchain-based solution is the uh, is at least the best concept out there. Jamie, I I'm going to take it from a little bit of a different angle. I'm not obviously a tech expert, and nor would I ever pretend to be. I think that the world is changing, and people are have really different expectations of what they own and their own kind of personal data that's out there, you know, every single day, especially today and yesterday and over the weekend, we hear news of cyber attacks and, you know, I jokingly say my, between my husband and I in the almost 10 years we served in, in the Obama administration, we could probably wallpaper our bathroom with the apology letters we've gotten saying, sorry, all of your data has been compromised and everything's been stolen. So I think that, you know, this entire concept of sort of a shared economy 
while intriguing and sounds really good, ended up just being, I share all my information and then a couple companies make a lot of money off of it. And so I think we're just kind of moving in a different direction where people say, you know what, I would like to have my identity and my information stored in a way that is more protected. And frankly, particularly with the Bitcoin blockchain, it, this is a system that's been around for over eight years and it's never been hacked. I would never say it can't be hacked, but it's it's proving itself much more secure than anything we've ever known. And we, as, as both thinkers and people who work with regulators or people who are on the front lines of implementing these things, have an obligation to present the best option that's out there right now. And this is better than what we know today. And I think there's some other pieces too. And it's not just from an individual perspective. I mean, I think when people think broadly about blockchain, you think first about the establishment uh, an ability to transact an asset that's both ubiquitous and unique. So uh, you can think about that as a representation of currency, but you can also think about that about an identity. That's kind of something that not only an individual, but a business, a government wants, an identity that is always unique to an individual, um, but can be ubiquitously accessed, um, regardless of what silo or system or, or, or structure you have in place. Um, second, as Steve said, you want that idea of being able to control the uses individually. And that's not just from the individual. Uh, there are many reasons why government, governments, government agencies, government entities don't want to hold identities. <coughs> they just want to know if certain attributes are, uh, you know, are present or not present. Um, and so while there are many companies uh, that are working on different aspects of this, and, and we are, have yet to see whether blockchain will be able to realize all of the visions that everybody has for it. There are certain of the features that, that blockchain as a technology is designed to and optimized for that, that pull on the same types of things that people want for, from an identity solution. Can we talk about a real world implementation? I mean, uh, any of the projects? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, what, one of the things I was gonna say is why are we talking about it? Because the technology is real and there are problems that can be solved. And that's something that I'm doing here, we're doing in Delaware, with looking at, uh, it's a use case with the health records. Um, there's a problem with sharing of information. How do you share uh, healthcare rec health record information um, for patients across doctors, across hospitals, across states, borders? And you can only do that if you can um, secure the information and the information is um, corresponds to a specific unique identity and that identity corresponds to a person. And so uh, the technology's distributed ledger technology makes that happen and that's integrally, uh, integrally <laughs> uh, related to uh, how do you determine that a person is who they say they're it, they, they are and all that. Some of us came back from the previous panel on identity and blockchains and some people argued on that panel that it's not advisable to store anything on the blockchain because of the radical transparency, right? And even hashes, someone claimed. So, um, but however, there, there are real world implementations and real uses. Can you explain in a layman's terms um, it, it, what value an implementation of blockchain has or brings in a real world case? Example. So the like example the that case. I would um, throw out there is the World Bank ranks um, the Republic of Georgia number three in the world for land title records, which might surprise you or may not, depending on how many post-Soviet experts there are out there. But what happened was a lot of really smart folks came in when the, um, when the Soviet Union collapsed and they helped get these uh, countries' records in order. So you've seen Estonia and other countries really take the lead in trying something new because as you've seen with Delaware, when there's a will, there's a way, right? And if you're willing to try something new and you have able partners who can implement some of these projects, then really the question is, why wouldn't you? And so what we have done is we have taken their, we Bitfury, we've worked in partnership with them to take the land title registry and hash it to the Bitcoin blockchain. Now, what's important there, for those of you who understand how this all works, um, and again, I'm not a technical expert, but it's really not that complicated, is that we have a private blockchain that is protected, and then it's anchored to the public Bitcoin blockchain. And so, yes, 
you can't you can see the hashes happening, but you can't see the exact detailed information. And I think that's the direction we're probably moving in. And look, part of the reason we did this is because we want to help the people of Georgia, and we think it's a great project, but we also want to read out to the world the successes that we're having and the hiccups that we're having, not that we've had any yet, but knock on wood, but I'm sure we will. And so we can provide those learnings to the rest of the world and say, hey, here's some of the ways that you should be cautious of this, here's the ways that it can be helpful, but it's really critical people understand this very early. And so the only way to really test all this stuff is to test it <laughs> and to have the willingness to do just that. Can we talk about the regulatory implications of blockchain in general? I mean, there's the wide variety of uh, regulatory spheres. There's prudential regulation, investor protection, consumer protection. There's also homeland security, security financial crime. There's uh, fiscal uh, policy goals and priorities that are involved in the trading and the storage of value. So how, can you, I'm, I'm looking at Alan, um, uh, as a lawyer, and you can provide some insights on that. Yes, um, I, I noticed that. I think I'm the I'm the one who's going to have to wear oh. the lawyer hat. Um, I'm so, also a lawyer. Good, okay. good. I'm really so good I, at pretending I'm a lawyer. I'm a I, I can hacker, share the. So. No, I'm just good at pretending. <laughs> I can share the opprobrium. I, what was interesting about that last panel also was that somebody made the comment that uh, when people first got into blockchain and identity, it became clear that they weren't. This wasn't a blockchain problem, this was an identity problem. And they said this in some kind of pejorative way. But, but I think you have to start from there, which is that blockchain isn't a, it, it's not a discipline. It's not really even a silo. It's a technical solution to problem, to problem sets. And so all of the different problem sets, one that you mentioned, all have a regulatory framework that applies to them. And so the question is, how does that regulatory framework apply to blockchain? Now, you mentioned a lot of the, uh, investor protection and regulatory protections, people think a lot first about the currency applications. But I don't think, I mean, we can talk about the currency regulations around, around Bitcoin or about virtual currencies. But I think from an identity perspective, it becomes as interesting or more interesting to say, well, what about the regulatory framework that, that guides identity and the way that identities are validated or stored or con controlled? And that's not a blockchain question. As you said, that's 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 an identity question. That's a that's a that's a question about how are how is both personally identifiable information and its use in storage regulated now, uh, but also the the establishment and the resolution and the validation and verification of identity information regulated now. And I think that that may be the, the conversation to have. Yeah, I was I was just going to say I think I think different states and you know the U.S. government hasn't hasn't done a whole lot. They've, they've got some, and in Europe, of course, there's a lot more protections for identity and and having having blockchain that doesn't necessarily mean that there will be more. It's just a question of just to frame. Right? I know that Steve wants to say wants to say something about pr probably privacy, but just to frame the discussion of the issue, I mentioned this one to one as a compliance officer. Every time you have to you an examiner comes in and you have to show compliance, demonstrate compliance internally. If there's a transaction above $3,000, you are supposed to have captured date of birth, full address, full name, and a form of a valid form of identification that has, has to be unexpired, government issued, photo. Three features. If you don't have those three features, you're in violation of the Bank Secrecy Act because that's a minimum requirement for identity. For KYC CFT, countering the financial of terrorism purposes. But there's also the need to identify clients or cu customers for other reasons, for business reasons. Know your customer because you want to really understand, you want to, if you're lending money, you have to be able to reach the person and collect your loan, right, or the repayment. So, and, and also law enforcement, people need to be arrestable, right? That's, that's the whole purpose of law enforcement. And so, the, there is a, this question of one-to-one of -one identity, the need for identity. When the blockchain comes, came out, the first blockchain came out, it was, it was pseudonymous, it was just a string of characters with no identity layer on top. That was one of, one of the f first uh, uh, flags I, I raised. How is this industry going to evolve when the protocol doesn't have identity? And everyone started talking about that. And then, when identity layers started being built on top, which are, it's kind of a solved problem now, 
the privacy and confidentiality issue came up. Because now we are able to de-anonymize hashes or, or private keys, public keys. We're able to see, know your transaction more than know your customer. If you really are able to, we are really able to analyze the transaction flows from the beginning to the end of, if you know the entry point into the blockchain, you're able to see everything. That's possible today. So how about privacy and confidentiality as a major problem? Enterprises, governments, uh, corporate investors, corporate clients are worried a lot about privacy and confidentiality for obvious reasons and also for liability reasons. So what do you have to say to that? And uh, do we need regulation on the blockchain for that because of that reason? Is what exists today sufficient to mandate the com compliance and, and cover these issues? Or do we need additional regulation? Can I, can I just take one quick Please. thing and then I'll pass it over to my friend here, which is I think more than regulation right now, we just need education. Okay. It, it, there's, the question I would have to you is what are we regulating? Regulate what? FinTech, beyond finance? I mean, you're looking at, it's a digital token that you transfer from one person to another and that transfer has a value and it's logged on the blockchain. It's just a very simple procedure and process. And it's very critical that anybody who's in a position to regulate anything first understands what we're even talking about. And, on, and, and we demystify some of the false information out there. Um, and I think that that, to me, is, much, is, a, is the best way that all of us in this community can serve the technology in the next few years. I think that the regulators in the US Congress have so far taken an education approach, and we're really grateful for that. Um, you know, I know that there's obviously some tumult going on around town, but from a blockchain perspective, the administration's been very encouraging, very responsible, very interested. Mick Mulvaney is a huge fan and totally gets it. Um, the members of Congress on the Hill are very inspired by the security side of this. And, you know, it'll be interesting to see around the world, if you've noticed in Japan, they're like, it's, it's, it's Bitcoin crazy there. So the more that regulators can just understand and and get it, then we can, I think go to the regulatory path. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you yeah, off. no. I mean, what you mentioned is is a it's a difficult problem because once you realize that Bitcoin addresses are, are pseudonymous, it, it's hard. I mean, through graph analysis and other techniques, you can identify who's behind certain transactions. The problem with with regulating that from a privacy point of view is that. Data protection regulations and privacy enforcement really depend on identifying who is a data controller, and that's the person who's responsible for dictating um, how data is processed, and then the processor who typically is the one that will, will act on those types of instructions. And if you're talking about a pure Bitcoin transaction, the controller is, is you, and you're not gonna regulate yourself from a privacy point of view. You can make an argument that the processor is the entire Bitcoin or, or whatever blockchain network you're using. What I find more interesting once we get into the identity question, though, is that, I mean, moving beyond like AML KYC regulations and renting the use of, of cryptocurrency for illicit uses, essentially privacy is an entirely different set of, of regulations. I mean, they, they all stem from a similar set of, of principles um, it's called the Fair Information Privacy Principles. They were created in the 1970s. They've been codified into a number of um, different types of, uh, of documents and, and agreements. Um, one, was, one was put up by the OECD in, in the 1980s, and, and they basically require countries to uh, adhere to a core set of principles, such as openness. They're open with how they collect data and what they use it for. They're, they have to keep it to the best of their ability, keep it up to date. They have to keep it secure. They have to give people the right to access the information that they have about them. They have to, um, and they have to let people remove that data if, if they want to. And those are just a few of the principles. And it gets even more complicated because every region or around the world has a different interpretation of how those rules are codified into law. Uh, for example, some areas uh, like, like Europe with uh, the Data Protection Directive and now the forthcoming General Data Protection Regulation, which uh, I'm not sure if anybody in the audience has heard of. I'm sure a, a bunch of you have. If, if nothing else, it's gotten a lot of attention because the fines for companies that break this could be up to 4% of global turnover. So imagine what that would mean for a company like Google or Facebook. Um, the European Union and Canada have sort of omnibus laws that cover every industry, whereas the United States 
has taken a bit of a different approach with HIPAA and COPPA and the Fair Credit Reporting Act and GLBA, where each industry has its own respective regulation. Is the blockchain compatible with all these uh, statutes and regulations? It is, because those regulations don't regulate a specific technology. They, okay. they regulate a function like we've all been discussing. So if you try to put it into terms that those regulators will understand, a data controller, a data processor, in a sense, if there's a blockchain-based identity solution, you're once again the controller because you can cryptographically ensure that data is only being used for purposes that you allow. And if you you don't have to trust that a company is going to delete your data if you ask them to. You don't have to trust that they're going to give it to you if you ask them to because you're the one that's actually giving it to them. And that's, I think, the, the issue here is you have to go back to first principles in the sense that the system's just architected different. The protocol is architected differently. Um, the question of who is the controller isn't as, isn't as important. The, the, the issue of uh, can you remove information is just a different type of question. It goes back to, uh, from an individual perspective, to what is the, what use is the data being used? Is that something that you've permitted? Do you have any control over that? Uh, and then from a government perspective, you, go, can, you, can go, you can peel back behind the identity of the individual and look at what you're actually interested in. And a certain, to a certain degree, your questions about anti-money laundering or counterterrorism financing go as much to the provenance of the money as it does to the identity of the handlers, particularly the intermediate handlers. And so when you look at a system like a blockchain-based system or, or a blockchain as a protocol, it gives you the opportunity to re-engineer your compliance processes around questions like provenance as opposed to the identities of intermediate handlers. Interesting. However, when a regulator comes in, you have to show the government, the unexpired government issue photo ID. I mean, some of the founders of One World Identity are Google product managers and Google, Google compliance people. And they tell me that when a regulated, first Google Payments is a regulated MSV uh, in all, all of the states in the United States. So when an examiner comes in, they want to see, they show them, okay, we have this machine learning system. Uh, you know, we have all this incredible tre treasure trove of data we can analyze patterns and behaviors and, and predict behaviors, show me the Excel sheet is the response. So to my point is, I think we're behind enormously, in the United, especially in the United States. I work also abroad. I'm currently working in Dubai with the government of Dubai, and they're investing millions and millions in re-engineering, I like that word, re-engineering all of these government services around shared ledgers uh, for cost efficiencies, right, I mean cost reduction, but also for safety and security and also the reduction of the attack surface in the case of identity systems. They don't want companies to store locally every piece of copy of an ID or every, a database of, of people when it could be cryptographically secure in one place, you know, in a vault in the middle of, uh, of, of the Swiss Alps, for example, and then you could ping it and, 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 and obtain a proof of that data point without having to replicate it. Right, so there's the re-engineering of systems of that type that allow you to get more uh, into architectures that look like that, which are used by different entities when you want a more secure way of, of storing information and of, of validating. But there's also the re-engineering of the compliance process because of course, in the United States, we're very, you know, you, you, you mentioned you need a government issued identification. And so you produce your driver's license, you produce your US passport, um, one of the folks who's created a, a blockchain-based identity uh, company likes to tell the story that, um, of course, he travels on a different passport uh, and gets stopped in different airports and gets asked, you know, for his identification documents and he gives his passport and they say, no, I need something else, meaning something more trusted. I don't trust the, esta the, 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 the establishment of that identity from the, that government source. I want something more trustable. And so, the, although we are not there, you're, I think you're exactly right, the blockchain get, provides the opportunity to re-architect some of the compliance orientation uh, around different ways of establishing and then verifying and validating identity. Right. Jamie, you were saying that you have, it's very important to educate uh, 
to understand, for people to understand the technology. And I know that you, Bitfury, and many of us have been trying to educate the regulators over time and the stakeholders. And but there's still some concerns that keep coming up. For example, the loss of a private key, right? Uh, consumer protection regulation is about the loss of funds, right? If a company loses sure. its funds, there's deposit insurance to cover it, there's a socialization of the loss, there's a mechanism to cover the loss, and now we have the ab ability to have multi-signature technology for a, uh, a, a, a private wallet, a private uh, storage of, of value, and what, but what if someone loses a key, right? What, what's going on about, what, how are we approaching, are we showing that we have alternative safeguards that shouldn't, are not covered by old regulation that, that, could, that make uh, uh, old regulation obsolete in a way? Yeah, but I, I think one of the, I know that if you're here during the day listening to this, you probably know a lot about this technology, but most people really don't. And I think that it's critical to ask a very basic question, which I go around the world asking people who kind of are part of the original internet, which is, if you're comparing the two and you think this is kind of the next wave, what year is it? And no one I've spoken to goes past, well, a couple people, but most people are like 93. So it's just really important to put that into context and remember that it's 2017 and we still don't have answers to the current systems. So naturally, we don't have all of the answers to the new systems. Um, so yeah, the short answer is of course we don't have all that stuff worked out, but that's why it's so critical that we're working on all this stuff so that we can come up with some of these answers. And you know, I would just, at the risk of going too high level, um, I, I think it's really important to take a step and look at the developed world and the developing world. And in some cases, the developed world is more in, um, is ready, more ready for some of these solutions. But in other cases, actually, the developing world is even more mobile, and they're doing more on their phones, and they're moving, you know, the expectation is actually that your, your whole kind of wallet is in your phone. And there's a leapfrogging effect. I mean, the number one most mobile country in the world for money movement is Kenya. And I think sometimes we think, oh, we're America, we can just move all this stuff forward, but we have different kind of regulatory roadblocks. And so I would encourage everybody to not just look at the US, which is critical and key, no, no question, but look beyond that too for some of the solutions that we might find and, and really think through, you know, Alan and I both work with the World Economic Forum. We oversee both the cyber and the blockchain councils and work together. What we saw in Davos and what we continue to see is that world leaders are literally crawling around saying, what solutions are there? I mean, there aren't that many tools in the toolbox to help us. Steve, you want to say something? Uh, I was just curious, does everyone in the audience know what, what multi-signature, multi-sig means, how it works? It's really a great technology, and, and basically it's, uh, probably everyone is familiar with the old story, like you have to turn both keys to launch a nuclear missile. It's similar to that, whereas uh, say you use some sort of wallet software to, to manage and, and spend your Bitcoins. Uh, you have a private key on, the, on that software, and then the wallet provider, when you want to execute a transaction, they also need to authorize it using their private key. So um, there has to be two keys, and then and then they'll typically use it um, uh, as long as the, the payment corresponds with sort of your, your customer profile. Uh, if they don't, or say you lose a key, you actually keep a third one in, in cold storage or, or in a lockbox or somewhere else so that you're actually able to recover your funds if you lose that one key. So this is a sort of a two of three type key scenario. And it's, and it's a really powerful thing because you have the ability to unilaterally move your money, move your data, but the wallet provider does does not, and uh, and and that's uh, and multi yeah. multi signature technology is in a micro environment. What I was, what self regulation or algorithmic regulation would be in the market environment. Meaning, and I know you, you should talk about the issuing shares and stocks on directly on the blockchain, which is a project that is being is happening in Delaware right now. So my <clears throat> my thinking is talking about how to move forward, how to think about the future of regulation. Are we at the um, beginning or the cusp of a 
wave where the smart contracts and self-executing logic and robots, basically, are going to enforce rules, making external um, oversight and supervision less necessary? Well, just from my perspective, yes. um, I think you're always going to need oversight, clearly, but I don't think you need necessarily special rules that regulate smart contracts or the technology. You may want enabling legislation so that everyone knows they can do it if they want to do it or here's how to do it, or that, um, that there are going to be no um, harms brought to someone who, who, who uses the technology. But I think the idea is, is exactly as Jamie said, you want to, you want to let people innovate. And, and you don't want to put any roadblocks in their way so they can, whether it's in Delaware or Dubai or Kenya or anywhere else, we've got some great technology. And just because you've got great, powerful technology does not mean you need to extra rules. Really, <coughs> um, that would be my comment. Certainly not yet. Not yet, no. We'll not figure out the problem before we need a solution. And I also think if we're painting, you know, apocalyptic, uh, dystopian fantasies of the future, like robots are going to enforce rules whether there's blockchain or not, you know. Um, the question is, does, does blockchain provide a better way, I don't know, to authenticate the robots, to, you know, to provide an identification or identity establishment or identity validation or authentication than current technologies do. Uh, I think it's easy to conflate kind of there's blockchain and cyber and AI and machine learning and autonomous activity and, and that's all gonna happen and it's all dystopian and, and we're just hurtling towards that. And I think we need to pull that apart and, 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 and say, well, look, what, what piece are we focused on here? Um, and, and there are already frameworks, whether it's GDPR in Europe or things like the NIST, you know, SP863 or other things like that, that, that give you a foundation for how you think about identity or digital identity and think about, number one, how does that apply to this kind of a technology? Number two, is this type of a technology better at doing the types of things that we want to try to do with identity than current technologies are? And then third, are the attributes of this technology such that it makes sense to change the way that we would want to regulate or think about exactly. overseeing this particular type of technology because it might get us better results, not just better regulation of the technology, but better end results. We'd have exactly. better in outcomes. integrity yeah. of, identity, uh, of identity, easier access, less um, ability to you know, have fraudulent records created off the same types of uh, biographics or biometrics or whatever, whatever the concerns are that we have. Is this a better way? And does that mean that things that either it fits within the structures that we've set up now, or should we think about evolving those structures in order to enable the use of this technology? It's very important that, and I, I feel like, you know, in the last two years since I've dedicated my life to this space, that it excites me when people get excited about this technology, because I do too. But I also worry when I hear people talk about it like it's some panacea. And I also worry about it when I hear people talk about it like it's some big behemoth monster. It's a tool. And it's a really powerful, awesome tool and one of the best things we've seen in a long time. And it's up to us to harness it that way. But we have to take a step back. And you know, I remember this event I was at early on where somebody said to me, well, how do you stop somebody from going to somebody's home and putting a gun to their head and saying, give me your land title? And I said, that's not a, that's not a problem that blockchain's gonna solve. I mean, let's be honest about what technology can yeah. do and can't do. You know, ISIS uses Twitter. So there are, <laughs> there are technology and cuts. And cash. Yeah. <laughs> and cash, <laughs> right. Always, so it's a great tool in the toolbox and we're just on the cusp of even trying to figure out all the ways that it can be helpful. Right. That seems to be a similar problem to worrying about overpopulation in Mars. If, if that's sort of like it's where too soon. Yeah. Well, the reason I brought up the uh, multi-signature and this automation or algorithmic regulation is that we had a promise here in the, in the blurb that says different approaches to regulation, right? So this is why I wanted to make you think about different approaches to regulation. And, uh, and now the final topic here is self-sovereign identity, which uh, if you think about the way I describe open versus closed blockchains is very, uh, in, the, in the purpose or the intent to you know, people who don't know what it is. Open blockchains democratize control. That's what they do. They push the control to the edges. 
right? Just as technology and the internet and mobile has pushed control to our devices, to us, the users. I would, I would think of an analogy coming in. So the, the entrance to this, this amphitheater, we only have the word amphitheater. We don't have session about blockchain identity. We have no metadata about this room. The metadata about this room is on the app. So if you, if you looked at the program, you signaled or you marked that as an interesting panel and you attended it, right? So that means that the user, through the, the device, the information about this panel was broadcast to the edge and not put in the center in the, at the entrance of the door. So it was, that was kind of an analogy I tried to find and probably not work. <laughs> I'm but, trying to follow you. <laughs> but it's, I think it, it's, it, blockchain, there's no central authority. That's a, that's a breakthrough. So you can transfer value across distances in any amount, value meaning anything, a representation of a share of stock, a representation of a land title. Can I, can I since you asked us to be controversial here, can I yes, challenge please. you on that a little bit? I mean, yes, that is all true. But when you're looking at identity projects, especially when you're working with a government, of course there's some authority. Right? I mean, you're going to be working with That's the where government, I was going. Right? Yes. <laughs> and you're going to be, and, and the citizens will want that. They want to know that their information has been validated and that their land title transferred and that it's yes. been recognized on that system and that a full e-governance system through a government is functional and actually serves their needs and cost, cuts costs for them and makes their lives more efficient. I mean, most people live under really broken systems around the world and they want systems that work better. So I think it... We can't fool ourselves into believing that this is something that's gonna happen in some weird vortex where all of a sudden you're just gonna be moving all this information sure. around and it's not gonna be validated by you know, sitting governments. And so okay. these, these challenges are complex and, yes. and I would, my only last point I'd make, and then I'll stop talking, I promise, is what I would like to see is every government from a regulatory perspective, as opposed to putting roadblocks in the way, make it a rule that every department in the US government should have a pilot project going right now. Can I just, can I challenge one thing because I, I, when I hear about regulations being enacted about blockchain or, I always go, why? Why do we even need this? Right. I mean, honestly, I, I see regulations, oh, this is going to be permitted or this is real, this is a contract. This, and I go, why? We don't need it now. Why? Why don't we? hundred percent. I, 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 I don't, I just don't get it. A regular, for example, <laughs> token sales, right? Or issuance of potential ownership in a cryptocurrency. Well, you're talking about cryptocurrency, I'm, I'm and then I'm putting that aside, though. I'm, I'm putting cryptocurrency, yeah. but I'm talking okay. about blockchain technology and yeah. okay. people well, it, coming it's out. It's a well, really important yeah. point. It, it, you're, I, think, I think you're saying there's the finance piece, and then there's the beyond finance. There's exactly. identity, exactly. there's all the other pieces. The financial piece yeah, I mean, has a different regulatory exactly. roadmap. Yeah. <laughs> right? on, the, on the privacy aspect, I mean, what's, what'll probably end up happening, because I don't think, I agree with you, there shouldn't be a, a blockchain privacy regulation. <laughs> I don't get it, so I don't when get it. I, when I talk to regulators here and in Europe, what's gonna happen is they're gonna study the technology, they're gonna issue out a request for information, request for comment, they may put out a, 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 like a, a guidance document, sort of how, like what FinCEN did in 2013 with Bitcoin, and then away we go. Or the other option is that companies involved could create some sort of self-certification regulatory regime that is enforceable, and that sort of helps regulators remove a sense of urgency to get involved. I mean, th those are two avenues that um, could help avoid the need of a, of a blockchain-specific regulation. But I, just to go back to your question, Juan, about self-sovereign identities, it's interesting, again, not, again, to go back to what Jamie said, that, that this technology is not a panacea. It's not that it's not going to solve every problem in the world. If we think about you know, travelers moving through the, the aviation system, do we want self-sovereign identities versus, versus something else? Probably not. You know, when we think about um, uh, you know, understanding who are law enforcement officers from other countries and who we could work with. Do we want them having self-sovereign identities? Well, probably not. Um, when we think about people smuggling other people through the desert, you know, on their way to Europe or their way somewhere else, do we want the smugglers to have self-sovereign identities? No, probably not. But how about the people who are being smuggled? Right. Well, that may be the best type of identity for them because it may be better than anything else because where they're coming from might not be a place that we can trust the identities. The people that are moving them or exploiting them or, or otherwise handling them may not be the, 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 tr the trusted source of information about them. So perhaps self-sovereign identity is a better solution for certain sets of individuals. 
Right. All of that, I think, supports the point that we don't need to figure that out at a table right now right. and write a rule about it. Exactly. But what we need to do is we need to, to kind of take the problem sets apart and say, look, there are pieces of this, pro uh, of this challenge or this, this area for which, whether it's blockchain technology, whether it's cryptocurrency, whether it's self-sovereign identity, this is not the solution to that problem. But it may be that, that there are elements, whether it's, again, the, te the technology protocol as a whole or a concept like self-sovereign identity, for which this does represent, if not the answer to the problem, then, then the least worst uh, you know, solution set for right now. Uh, and so I think that it's important, although it's more satisfying to be able to say yes or no to, you know, to a question like self-sovereign identity, I think we have to step back from it and say, to which problem are we trying to address? Fair enough, and a very good yeah. way to end this on my part. So if you would like to ask any question, please approach the mics. And if you don't have any question, I'd like to people to have, I mean, our panelists to make any closing statements or we have, we started late, so we have some time. There's a question. Mark? Oh, sorry. You first. Sure, thanks, Mark. Steve Wilson from Constellation Research. More a statement than a question, sorry, but the idea that blockchain decentralizes things is a bit of a myth. The blockchain was designed in order to decentralise electronic cash. Um, there are still intermediaries, there are different intermediaries. I think Jamie nailed it. There is always going to be admin. So I, I think that when we talk about government regulations, we need to just um, calm down our expectations a little bit that the capacity for blockchain to dramatically change things is limited by the fact that it only decentralises purely digital assets. When you're trying to tokenise and you're trying to bridge the real world and the digital blockchain, there are always going to be agents that do the tokenization. There always needs to be three parties. That I, don't, I don't know if I agree with that, actually, because um, in the, the, the distributed ledger technology we're working with Delaware, which is private, it's completely decentralized and the state is not a part of it. And there isn't an agent that it all goes through. So, so I, what's, what's on that blockchain for Delaware? Excuse me? What would be on that well, blockchain? Um, well, we are going to be putting um, documents, digital information, um, all, all different types of information. Which must be tokenized by some... No, it's not going to be tokenized. The documents are actually right on the distributed ledger. Um, it's with a different... It's a with Symbiont and with their distributed ledger technology. So it's not tokenized. The information is right on the distributed ledger and there isn't a third party that is managing it or acting as an agent. It's completely will you, decentralized. Will you anchor it at all? To, will you anchor it at all to the public blockchain? Or will no, you... It no, will no. always be completely private. Right, right now it's, it's completely separate. It's not anchored to public blockchain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Comment on that? Yeah, I mean, I understand what you're saying. When, when sometimes when people get into the idea, is it really decentralized or not? And, and the way that that discussion can have some merit with me is when you get into the permission chains and if there is only, I mean, I think for a Hyperledger um, POC, I think you need a minimum of four or five nodes to do that. At a certain point, if you have so many down, it could be considered a little bit centralized if one or two get uh, if one or two get hacked or compromised, but but otherwise, I mean, I agree with Andrea and, and Jamie. I mean, the, the information is decentralized in the fact that there is no central clearinghouse that people that, that people have to trust. They either have to trust, trust the, the code or they or they 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 they, they, they trust they trust themselves. They trust I mean, it's it's not a, yeah, it's not a complete like um, obvi obviation of no trust at all. It's trust in the network. We still trust need to network. trust the well, network. The yeah. only amendment I would make to that um, is I fully support the decentralized ledger system, whether it's private or public, and our company obviously does both. But I do think it is pretty critical from a security standpoint that it ultimately has an anchor to, in our, in our preference at the moment from a security standpoint, is the Bitcoin blockchain. And I'm curious if you are in the current testing phase, and I know I'm sort of asking the same question before, or if you, if you ever see a moment where you would anchor it for that security. I mean, because to, to me, that's sort of the, the ultimate, there's so many benefits to distributed ledger technology, but the Bitcoin aspect of it, while some people don't love that word, is really the backbone to the security. Well, not, not, not for all the ledgers, though. This is a private distributed ledger. So yeah, it's, it's yeah. completely separate from that, and it has its own security, and it's, uh, Amazing. you know, so very separate. Yeah. Okay. Mark? I, okay. Um, 
uh, two uh, two part questions. Uh, the first in 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 Delaware, I think like one of the sort of interesting things about um, security ownership on the uh, on the blockchain is that you're addressing this sort of issue that people don't have direct in as things stand right now, people don't have direct ownership of of the securities. It's all gone through. Um, like, you know, you have a claim on your broker who has a claim on a claim on a claim and so forth. And maybe uh, uh, you could talk a little bit about that problem. That oh, you're talking about the DTC issue. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Um, I'm, yeah. <laughs> that would take a lot, uh, that, would, that would take and, and, too long. I mean, okay, the DTC okay. is, you know, is the, is the record holder of 90% of, of all the publicly traded securities and Okay. I, this this isn't the place for that that conversation. Okay, right the, the, and then the the other uh, for 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 both the lawyers and anyone else who wants to jump in. Um, what do you make of the argument that blockchain developers, software developers, have a fiduciary relationship? Blockchain developers have a fiduciary. Fiduciary. That's a, that's a legal that's a legal question. So it depends who the relationship to whom, right? Well, you I, I, out. I see your point, though. In a, and I, but I think that it's actually a, a, feature, a design feature, at least of the Bitcoin blockchain, of a proof-of-work type of consensus mechanism, which is that you've... Part of the beauty of the, of the Bitcoin blockchain is was the intention both to remove the intermediaries but also remove the need, the need for trust in, uh, you know, Putting reliance on anything other than the, than the protocol. Uh, thus, you know, <coughs> you don't need an intermediary in, in which to place your trust that a transaction is happening or that uh, an asset isn't being double spent. So it's not a. It's almost. It's a post trust technology. Um, the third part of if you see if you break down its attributes, this kind of um, the the solution to the Byzantine uh, you know general's computing problem is in essence the building in of the fiduciary relationship in the sense that this goes to Jamie and I want to transact uh, in Bitcoin. I want to give Jamie a Bitcoin. Um, Thank so, you. So I, yeah, these days, Thank I want to give Jamie much. a quarter of a Bitcoin. <laughs> no, a tenth a full of a Bitcoin. Bitcoin. <laughs> um, you know, if I wanted to do that with a dollar, I'd just hand Jamie a dollar. If I want to give it with Bitcoin, I, I, yeah, I broadcast out to all of you, I want to give Jamie a Bitcoin, and so you all take your ledgers out and you look at my ledger and you see if I have a Bitcoin. So you, okay, you scratch that out and you write it in Jamie's Bitcoin and then everybody adjusts their ledger and then it's done. Why do you all do that? Not out of the goodness of your hearts. And not um, because you're a fiduciary. And, and, not, and not because, because you're, you're a fiduciary. And not because That's you're the a fiduciary, point. right. Not, not because of fiduciary. fiduciary, because you're independently financially motivated to do that. So rather than placing a fiduciary duty on you, I'm in fact giving you a, a pecuniary incentive in which to act in a, in a, in a way. So there's, there's almost a post-fiduciary relationship. You don't, you, you don't need the, the fiduciary relationship because the protocol separately incentivizes. So for that reason, I think that the protocol addresses the need for that type of concept, but it obviates the requirement of a fiduciary relationship. And in fact, if placing a fiduciary relationship on the mining community or on the node operators or on uh, and anybody else is contrary to the design principle. It, and you don't want that because uh, the whole point, when you have a fiduciary, there's always this, this notion that the fiduciary could break his fiduciary duty or her fiduciary duty, right? And then that screws everybody up, but you don't have that here. That can't happen, that doesn't happen. So it's, it's really better you know, than, than a fiduciary relationship. It's engineered relationship. to obviate the need for it. Yeah, yeah no need for it. You, you need the fiduciary when, there's, when, when that's the only thing that you have. That's another example of a self-enforced rule, right? Or a protocol-enforced rule that doesn't require a, an, a construct, an external construct to, to uh, uh, create the outcome. It's just done by the protocol. That's how consensus is reached. It's a design feature. It's a design feature. Right. Exactly. Well, and to put an even finer point on it, you know, money makes the world go round. And when Bitcoin <laughs> is worth $400, it's different than when it's worth $2,000. And when you have skin in the game and you have a financial incentive to keep the system secure, it becomes more and more secure. I have more questions. And <laughs> I really want to follow up on the fiduciary question. That's not why I stepped up here. Um, so my question is somewhat related, um, sort of, in that there's a legal component to it. I'm curious, I've had this phrase kicking around in my mind for a while, which is 
distributed presence creates distributed jurisdiction or creates distributed liability. And I'm curious if you think that is a some... sentence that could really only be said in Washington, uh, D.C. Yeah, I, I, really, I like it, actually. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, you I'll take a quarter of a Bitcoin for it. So <laughs> my, um, my question is, is there something about distributed ledgers or blockchain that um, you think creates a need for us to change the way we view uh, jurisdiction? Subject matter jurisdiction? Or personal Personal ju Personal, ju I, personal I'm, jurisdiction. I'm having a flashback to the creation of the internet yeah, 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 in 1998. Yeah, yeah. So Can, what are your thoughts on that? I, I, here's what I think. I think that that the, the smart contracts, um, well, if you're working with smart contracts, the jurisdiction can be built into the smart contract. And of course, I'd love every smart contract to name Delaware as the um, jurisdiction that, that governs the, the contract or perhaps even the, the distributed ledger or the blockchain. And then you could even um, include, uh, for example, a certain dispute mechanisms. Like we have the Delaware Rapid Arbitration Act, which I think was built for blockchain disputes because uh, the dispute can be heard um, in four months from beginning to end. So we have this whole mechanism, and it's, it's just um, perfect for that. So I, I don't think you need you need a new rule for a personal jurisdiction or a subject matter. I mean, I think I think you can just write it right in. And as it pertains to, to, to privacy and, and data protection, uh, I was talking earlier about a whole like kaleidoscope of, of regulations, but there is a silver bullet to all of it, and, and that is if you can get explicit consent to, um, to utilize data for, for a given purpose. And to do that, that means you can't use a pre-filled out form, you can't use a pre-checked box, like someone has to make a, an authoritative act saying you can use my data. Well, signing something with a, a private key is the best representation of something like that. So therefore, that kind of obviates the need to have any sort of jurisdictional responsibility, at least as it pertains to that use case. And I think that, that, that to take that even further, just the fact that you're using that this platform means you've consented to, to jurisdiction. And I think also, I mean, ironically, from a law enforcement perspective, um, that type of jurisdictional relationship means no uh, mutual legal assistance treaties, no, you know, none of the none of the baggage that a lot of other enforcement mechanisms it's get Information up. sharing by design. Exactly, and, so, and that you can, and that for all of the benefits and pseudonym, pseudon, pseudonymity and other things that benefits that, it, that you derive from the use of the platform, you also consent to certain things by the use of the platform. It is what it is, and, one, and, and, the fact, and it is omnipresent, and it is multi-jurisdictional, and it is transparent, uh, and that, that, that just is what the platform is. We have more questions. Let's try to, uh, Mr. Birch. Uh, yeah, I, I wanted to kind of follow up Steve's question, really, because I'm still curious about this. So I thought we could use the land example, because that was the example that was given. So. <clears throat> so it seems to me the threat model isn't, I mean, yours was exaggerated, I know. So. But the threat model is, you know, grandma gets an email, grandma presses the wrong button on the email, and now grandma's house belongs to someone in Minsk, and hard luck, you can't get it back. And you'll say, well, that's not true, because actually there'll be third parties that hold the title. And Well, if there are the third parties that hold the title, what's the point of the blockchain in the middle? I don't really get that part of it. And well, the second part of my question is, uh, if we're going to use, um, we're going to anchor using the Bitcoin blockchain, for example, to the best of my knowledge, there's no academic evidence whatsoever that, that the block forming will continue once the mining reward is exhausted. So how can it be sensible for anyone with any kind of long-term plan, which a land registry would have to be, it's not a temporary thing, mm -hmm. <clears throat> wouldn't it be sort of imprudent uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't understand about the financial law things that Mark was going on about. Uh, but wouldn't it be imprudent on the borderline of negligent uh, to commit to the Bitcoin blockchain in those circumstances? So let me. I, I, I'm sure. I mean, given the level of discussion, people understand. But you are basically taking an asset and transferring it and saying, "This is now. I, I own this." And that record of what happened is placed in that immutable record, right? And you can't change it. If somebody were to try and change it, this is the threat, right? If somebody were to try and change it for the first time ever, actually, you can fight that. You can say, actually, no, you just tried to move my land over to Minsk, and I have a real record saying here that that's impossible because I own this. Grandma. That never existed before. Grandma. You can still lose a private key. 
Grandma which, said it's okay to transfer it to Mint. She hit the wrong button by accident. Right, and that's why I'm saying that this is this is why it's really important to understand that this is this technology isn't a panacea. Of course, there will be mistakes, but the immutability outweighs the the follow up that you would have to do if there was a mistake. And of course, you have so the house now immutably belongs to the person in Minsk. We can't. Well, you went. What about you fraud? Actually I mean, asked about the threat vector, and I actually I'm think it's a, it's a it's a story that your founders talk about. What's the actual threat vector that motivated them to create the company? Right. It's not grandma. It's not, and it's not the criminal trying to get grandma to move the, the property to Mint. Correct. I mean, basically, the reason that we think this is so critical is because you know our own founder, when the when the Soviet Union crashed, he was he's Latvian. They lost everything. Everything, all their money, all their savings. There was no record that any of this belonged to them. All of their pension, everything. And so, you, I think it's really critical. This is why I say we have to look at it from a developing and a developed world perspective. That, for the first time ever, the immutability of that record. Even if yes, there will be times when maybe a mistake was made, and then you have to go back through lawyers and fix something. It is so critical that you actually have these records now that say, this is my land, I own it. You can't just go in there now into the record and just change it and give my land to Bob. And if you do do that, I can see that you tried to do that. Now, on the second question, I don't want to turn this into a big conversation about whether you're for Bitcoin or not, but I do think it's probably worth a separate panel. I fundamentally am a big believer that that is where the security lies in this entire system at the moment. Now, whether we're going to have other public blockchains and there's going to be, live in, we're going to live in a world where there's 10 public blockchains and everything's anchored to them, or we're going to have a zillion private blockchains and some of them will be anchored to one big public blockchain, I don't know. But I do think that the, the fundamental way that the Bitcoin blockchain works, it's, it's important people understand that that's, that's where the security lies. And also that there are plenty of examples of technologies that evolve from free to freemium to fee-based. And there's no reason to think that this technology isn't going to be another one of them. Agreed. So, so it won't be cheaper in the long run. Uh, I think that you transfer from a mining reward to a fee-based reward system as one of many solu potential solutions to that challenge is not, a, not an unforeseeable solution to the problem 100%. set that you're putting forward. Just uh, real quick from my point of view, I think you hit on a couple of really interesting points. I mean, for one, the blockchain is not the solution to everything and it doesn't exist in a vacuum. You're talking about a spear phishing attack or something like that. Blockchain is not going to defend against that. You have to combine it with other um, cybersecurity technologies. And, uh, and then if something does happen, I mean, maybe you need to uh, put some sort of uh, seal a tamper-proof seal on a, on a land title document and then put it somewhere safe so that if you actually do have to go back and verify that you are the true owner of that, there might be a way to do it. Uh, regarding your, your second point about the, the Bitcoin blockchain, I, I do, I, I, I'm, I'm torn between open versus closed and I do recognize that there are issues with, with the Bitcoin blockchain. I mean, a few weeks ago there was a concern it was going to fork. Does that mean there would be two land titles to, to a given property? It, and I mean, Jamie, you'll... I think you'll agree that there are scalability issues and some things that need to be I think worked there's out. Scalability with it. questions, but I also think that if you tried to create Facebook in 1993, you probably couldn't have done that either. Yeah, I'm, I'm not saying that it's anything should be perfect right from the beginning, yeah. but um, but there are some. But with some the Lightning Network and all of the other things that we're seeing, I, we feel very confident that it will scale and it'll scale over time. And I hope it does, but yeah. but I think it yeah. it's also is a fair question to ask. Yeah, totally. We've gone over our time too much, but. I think it's a good, interesting conversation. So let's go. Unless someone stops us. Have they stopped filming? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh. we can go on. Yeah, please ask. Hey, thanks. Uh, I, I want to take this, if you guys don't mind, back to identity. Right? So um, <laughs> like one of the first questions was, like, what is a ledger going to do? Is distributed ledger going to do for identity? I, I'm not sure. I, have, I, I, I comprehend the answer you guys gave, if any. Right? So. If in the end, like this comes down to providence and I need to trust somebody that the identity is a good one, like it's a good passport issuing authority, and how, what problem is a ledger going to solve that this trusted guy can't solve through APIs or, or whatnot? Like wh wh what is exactly my benefit? From using, from from using a distributed ledger technology? For identity. I, say, I fully believe all the other stuff. Yeah, yeah, great, 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 great. But for identity, what, what can't I do? Because I need to trust someone anyway to issue the identity. So what can't I do just by having that guy be the single source of trust? 
so for an example, take, take medical records. Uh, um, I mean, the, the healthcare industry, I think, spends about $3 trillion a year. And I, I, I saw a Harvard Business Review study that um, said about 30% of that was due, was due to waste, uh, duplicate treatments, lost records. And, uh, and, and there's a whole debate as to whether or not you should put medical records actually on the blockchain or use um, hashes of those records to create one central directory of, of a blockchain. But if you can create a system like that, then, uh, then you, can, um, you can achieve what's considered to be a longitudinal, I can't say that word, but longitudinal view of an entire patient's history. So you cut out all that waste, all those lost records, all that duplicate treatment, and you don't necessarily have to trust that every single medical provider that you have is going to be able to keep their databases up to date and reconcile that with, with each other, or that even if you go to a new, you move to a new city, you go to a new doctor, how are they going to be able to find every single healthcare provider you went to before? Whereas if there's a blockchain system, they can look you up by your unique patient ID and then, uh, and then have directions to all the information, and then through multi-sig, they can access those records to help you. I'm going to take it from a different perspective, which is that of the issues on Earth that are hardest to solve, identity I would put at like, pretty much the top. And for that, I mean, yes, we have issues in our own country with electronic health records and in the developing world, in the developed world, but 2.5 billion people in this world have no identity, not a single piece of paper that validates that they exist. That's a very serious problem that needs to be solved. Do I think this technology can help solve that? Yes. Do I think it's really, really complicated? Yes. And I think that that's why I'm advocating for really focused pilot projects that can help lead the way to what could potentially be a better global interoperable system. But there is no question, uh, this is the biggest elephant in the room, and it is not easy. It's just the big message is you have a technology for the first time ever that can offer this immutable record of identity. Now it's up to us to figure out how to really do that. There's also the benefit of uh, portability of identity. You know, the, the great question about jurisdiction. And uh, so there are benefits that are beyond the control or the centralization that make identity on a blockchain or solutions or hybrid identity solutions with blockchain components like the anchor, the public anchor. I personally believe the public anchor is fundamental for, for identity. So it's not under the control of any entity. There's no back door. There's no way to. Yeah. Um, so that, that, to me, is fundamental for any especially self-sovereign system. But there's a lot of benefits in cost reductions, efficiencies, uh, portability, and ownership by the individual. So it's, it's again, it's the, the democratization of ownership and uh, empowerment of the individual. That is what I think this, what is really truly revolutionary about the blockchain. And, the, and again, just to, just to go back to your question, why is, it, why is the blockchain the better technological platform for that than other things that we have? That's where you string together these questions of security, uh, these questions of, of individualized control, these questions of portability, um, other questions of either being able to attest to identity um, in other ways, like through uh, through reputation or longitudinal examination, um, and uh, and also to be able to establish identity even in the la even the absence of um, a trusted initial governmental system of record, and so this te this technological platform gives you the opportunity to address some of those challenges that have been barriers or problems with other types of technologies that are trying to be used for ubiquitous identity or a single type of identity. And this is the end. Thank you all very Thank much. Thank you, everyone. Andrea, Jamie, uh, Steve, and Alan. Thank you so much. <laughs>